For the next hour, we'll have a panel discussion. This is your chance to ask any questions that uh, have come to mind throughout the discussions this morning. We've got a, a panel of experts, and uh, my job really is to get the ball rolling and um, you know, handle any, uh, any challenges, technical or otherwise. And we've also got, um, and I'm extremely grateful for Colin Rule, who you'll see up on the big screen, sitting in the comfort of his hotel room in Cincinnati. Um, so the format is, I'll ask each panelist to introduce themselves. I'm, I'll get the ball rolling with a sort of a general question. Um, and then if you have a question, raise your hand. And we have Chanel at the back, who has a roaming mic. And um, if you can't wait for Chanel to get you with the mic, just stand up and shout your question. Uh, and if you want any of the panelists in particular to uh, respond to your question, just say so. All right. So, um, well, welcome panelists. Who's going to kick us off with introductions? Um, hello, my name's Stephen Anderson. I'm a family mediator from Ipswich and Suffolk. I've done about half a dozen online mediations um, to varying degrees of success over the last um, two years. And I regularly consult people, people consult me online. So for the one-on-one -on -one assessment, intake meetings, whatever you might call it, those are, you know, it's, I, w I wouldn't say common, but not uncommon, do that online and then actually do the mediation um, in person. Um, that's, that's my experience. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, hello, I'm Tim Wallace, civil and commercial mediator. Um, my life changed, I didn't realize what I was about to, but when I read a report by Mr. Henry Brown in 1991, um, things never seemed quite the same since. Uh, I've been a full-time independent mediator uh, for the last seven years or so, uh, and during that time I've been appointed, which is relevant for today, um, as chair of Claims Portal Limited, uh, which deals with something like eight or 900,000 um, personal injury-related claims um, per annum. Uh, claims under £25,000, um, but it uh, combines my interest in, in technology um, uh, and dispute resolution. Welcome, Tim. Uh, hello again, it's Mike um, speaking. I just wanted to pick up on just one point which was raised a few times by folk that uh, chatted to you over coffee, is um, in terms of ODR, do we mean uh, technology-enabled ADR processes, i.e. it's very interesting listening to, to Bill about the use of Skype, and is that an ODR process or is that just a normal ADR procedure where the mediator has been innovative in using technology to support the process. And I would argue that use, use of Skype and, and telephone calls is a, an advanced or a different way of a, a, a technology-enabled ADR process. Um, my understanding and how I answer the question of coffee about ODR is it's very much sort of a platform orientated concept where it's, it's not quite an aircraft dashboard with, with options, but it's a technology-based platform which can deal with large volumes of disputes. It's a different field, different era, different type of process which we are using technology to deal with large volumes of disputes more effectively orientated around commercialization of, of um, an organization. So I think I just wanted to sort of make that distinction as I understand it. You may have other questions, but I see ODR as very much a you know, technology oriented process and not just tweaks to a very well established face to face process. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, I, I just introduced myself earlier. My name is Pablo Cortez. I'm academic at uh, Leicester University. Um, I'll, I'll pass the mic on, but just uh, somebody asked me during the coffee break um, the, the, a quick question on the impact of the um, ADR directive and whether what is understood by businesses and and whether it includes traders who are sole tra traders. And it does. Um, so, I mean, the impact it will be so significant that any 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 type of transaction between somebody who is um, uh, operating on a professional capacity with a consumer who is um, buying something for its personal use will be, you know, will be affected and will fall within the scope of the of the directive. And I don't think that directive or the audio regulation fix any type or establish any type of 
uh, technical criteria to fitting um, what is considered online dispute resolution or online mediation. It only requires that, that there are um, schemes or procedures whereby individuals, consumers, and, and companies can resolve their disputes outside the courts, whether it is through mediation, arbitration, and importantly, without requiring them to meet face to face. Uh, so my understanding is that even telephone mediation will, feel, will um, fall within the scope um, of, the, of the directive. And with that, I pass on. Thank you, Pablo. Pablo. Hi, um, I'm Jo Holland. Um, I used to be the court mediator, um, and all the small claims mediations were done over the phone. Um, tiny portion of people opted for face-to-face. -face. When I left the civil service, um, I set up small claims mediation as a private um, company, wanting to focus on the telephone model, but develop it a bit further and looking at ODR and, and everything that's going on with it. And I would absolutely agree with what you said in that we just class ourselves as, as innovative in that we will use whatever tools we have to meet the needs of the parties and sometimes we'll have one on the phone one on skype i've done a case where the the uh, landlord was in the british virgin islands and could only use email we did it over a few days it, it settled we just use every trick in the book really to do it and we do it every day every week um, in high volumes um, it's really interesting to see mike you, you listed up some of the big names, the retail names, and one of my um, jobs is I'm knocking on doors and saying, you know, this directive is coming and you need to start looking at this now. One of those names actually refuses to mediate. So before we even look at ODR, we've got to actually get them to consider mediation. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges, certainly for small claims, it's so frustrating. You can bang on about it that you know it's going to save you money. The courts expect it, pre-action protocol, but still we have to overcome the barrier of them not wanting to mediate. So actually, we can engage and embrace ODR, but we've got to get over that barrier too. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you, Joe. And Colin, over to you. Yes, good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm Colin Rule. I'm a COO, Chief Operating Officer, and co-founder of a company called Modria.com, based in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's, it makes my heart hurt to see all my friends there and realize I can't be there with you. Uh, I wish that I was, but I guess the plus is I'm probably the only panelist right now that's not wearing shoes. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was director of online dispute resolution at eBay and PayPal for eight years prior to starting Modria in 2011. And, and Modria does a wide variety of online dispute resolution work around the world. But I can't, uh, I can't help but weigh in on the, the topic. I love how that's emerged kind of during our introductions. But uh, I understand what Mike is saying. I do think that online dispute resolution opens up some very exciting new capabilities, and we can address that over the course of the panel. I'm sure you guys are discussing it all day today. But I prefer what Pablo is saying, kind of the big tent definition. Any application of technology to the practice of ADR is ODR. And that can be in-person technology, like an LCD projector. That could be a telephone, like, like Joe was mentioning. Uh, and I think that once you get into the algorithmic potential, it starts to get really, really exciting. But uh, all ADR, I think, is moving in the direction of ODR. The reason why I can't be with you guys is because I'm at the Association for Conflict Resolution Conference in Cincinnati today. Uh, and I often say to mediators, uh, do you do online dispute resolution? And they go, no, no, I don't do online dispute resolution. And then I say, well, do you email your parties? Do you do phone calls with your parties? Do you send them calendar invitations? Do you track changes in Word documents? Do you use spreadsheets to discuss assets? And then they go, yeah, yeah, I guess I do do those things. And I say, well, that's ODR. And eventually, I think Mike, Mike's point is prescient. All ADR is going to start to look like ODR. And the line between ADR and ODR is going to get so fuzzy it will become meaningless. That's my perspective on it. Thank you, Colin. Um, Colin, whilst, whilst we've got you and we've got a good connection, I want, I'm, I'm inclined to take advantage of that. Um, I, you know, I think the, the eBay pilot that um, I referred to earlier was a success. 
it proved, first of all, that online mediation uh, can be done. You know, you can get two parties sure. in different parts of the world um, resolving a dispute with a, uh, a virtual mediator, if you like. But I think, secondly, um, it uh, somehow f uh, proved that one can incentivize parties to participate voluntarily in a process at quite an astronomical scale. Can you say a little bit more about, about that? Sure. Well, I, you know, I think eBay was an important validation for online dispute resolution because we did, we did more than 60 million cases a year, and that platform is still operating. Uh, and I know eBay does 60 million cases a year. I don't doubt that Amazon does a similar volume. And now we have Taobao and Alibaba. I'm sure they do even more cases than that. So I think it is important to show that uh, dispute resolution services can scale, they can be effective, they can be extrajudicial. Um, I will say it wasn't a pure mediation model. And if you look, uh, actually, there was a company called Square Trade that worked on eBay uh, kind of in the early days, 2000, 2001, 2002. They did mediation, and they got up to about a million cases a year. But eventually what happened was once, we, once I joined eBay in 2003, we started to get much more algorithmic, and we introduced evaluative processes into the ODR design as well. And we actually made it a mandatory part of the marketplace. And that was why the volume scaled. So I think, again, this gets back to Mike's comments. We need to think creatively about the approaches that we can use online and how the algorithmic power of computers can magnify the scope of the work that we do. But I do think that eBay was an important validation. And that's one of the reasons why we spun that technology out and created Modria to, to continue to innovate on the back of that platform. So hopefully soon, those 60 million cases will seem small with what's coming around the corner. Interesting. Thanks, Colin. Uh, we've got a, a hand up uh, and a question. Yeah, um, Chris Cox, um, I'm a solicitor and a mediator. I'm trying to get a, a handle on what sort of cases that these millions were dealt with. Are there cases about fridges and televisions and tasters, or are they big commercial disputes involving lots of money? Well, what is it all about? Or is this just big business trying to snuff out the consumer's complaint? <laughs> I love UK questions. You guys, the, don't pull any punches. Um, well, I feel very strongly it was not about big business just snuffing out complaints. Uh, I think when eBay first started, the redress processes that they provided were inadequate. And I think a lot of consumers were frustrated, and they had bad experiences with, with sellers. They were dissatisfied, and they didn't have a redress option that was easily available to them. And eBay very quickly, because eBay gathers lots and lots of data about these buyers, they realized in order to have trust in the marketplace, in order to continue to grow eBay's global footprint, they had to provide meaningful, transparent, easily accessible, and effective resolution processes. So eBay now spends 150 plus million dollars a year taking care of buyers around the world because they want to make sure that every transaction that a buyer has is is uh, resolved effectively. 99% of transactions don't generate a problem. It's only 1% of transactions on eBay that generate a dispute. So uh, I, I think that that 60 million, it's not only buyer-initiated complaints against sellers. It's also seller-initiated complaints against buyers for non-payment. There were issues around uh, reviews and reputations that were left that sellers and buyers felt that they didn't deserve. There were intellectual property claims where one eBay seller would steal images or language from another user or maybe violate intellectual property rights of corporations by using trademarks and images uh, without authorization. So we had a wide variety of disputes that we were dealing with at eBay. Um, but now, since we've spun off and done Modria, we now do debt-related cases, we do insurance cases, we're doing family and divorce mediation, we're doing tax appeals, uh, we're doing small claims. So I think the same engine that we built at eBay is relevant to these other volumes. We're not yet operating at the same scale that we did at eBay, but the eBay system is still operating, even though uh, I'm not inside the company running it anymore. It's still handling the same volume of cases. But I think they've done a very good job building a system that provides meaningful redress to consumers. Thanks, Colin. We've got hands shooting up now. Uh, could we have a microphone, please? I speak as a consumer. Um, I have filled in the online complaints form uh, that I downloaded from 
the international uh, ally uh, in respect of, of, perhaps I shouldn't be too specific, but it tells me that I should put my complaint in however many words it was, and that uh, my bill of documents should be scanned in. And it told me then it, that I, it had accepted my complaint in the sense that I had a number and it was going to be processed and that I should hear in 10 days time. And I look every day rather wistfully at my uh, incoming emails, but unfortunately there is absolutely a slight shrugging of the shoulders and no doubt something will happen. <laughs> uh, and uh, there it is. Now, I'm interested to know uh, from the panel and also uh, in respect of algorithms, um, how the directive and uh, the algorithms are going to feed in uh, to this complaint, which undoubtedly is presently online, uh, will assuming that there is further shrugging of the shoulders, uh, will under the directive somebody be produced uh, who will mediate and kindly uh, pick up the phone or a bit of Skype or something like that? I slightly doubt it. I, I'm just wondering where the third party mediation element would come in and also how the algorithm would be applied in order to deal with, I'm sorry I haven't said what my complaint is, it seems fairly straightforward to me. It's a question of being required to make a double payment for something. Um, oh, okay. Uh, there we are. Pablo, can you respond to part of that and we'll ask Colin for the algor algorithmic part of the question. Right, no, the directive does not make uh, the use of mediation or any ADR process compulsory per se. It does, however, require businesses, traders, to notify consumers that there are certified ADR schemes, and they are required also to notify them whether or not they participate in these schemes. And if they do participate in these schemes, it has to be also, they have to offer the service online or basically at a distance. Uh, the hope is that because the business will have to send an actual physical letter or an email to the complainant consumer, that because it will look bad by saying, well, you know, you have the, um, you know, Modria um, a, as a certified provider in this country, uh, which, which deals with this type of disputes, but unfortunately, I don't participate into the scheme. Okay, this could be misleading and even more annoying to the consumer. Why do I get an email saying this? Uh, but the hope is that by having to provide this information, the business will decide to opt in. There are also some type of uh, uh, businesses like banks, insurance companies, and so on, who are legally required to opt in a, an a, a your scheme. For instance, in this sec a specific sector is a financial ombudsman service. So they will have to say, well, uh, the, the force is available to deal with complaints and I have the obligation to participate. And then the dispute will be handed over to FOSS, who will, um, who will try first to mediate between the parties and reach a settlement, and if not, uh, an investigator, case handler, or an ombudsman will make um, a recommendation, which if it's accepted by the, by the consumer, will be binding on the business. So, Again, the directive does not make it compulsory, the business participation, but it requires the business to inform the consumer about these schemes. So it will raise awareness. Okay. Um, and Pablo, um, sorry, Mike, you talked about a, some kind of triage system which uses algorithms. Is that right? That's right. And yeah. I, I think the, um, the example of, of this sort of case is that the technology platform behind the uh, the, the system where the data or the, your complaint is actually uploaded is that the technology will be able to filter and process some of the complaints um, really using an artificial intelligence model, but it's not 
not making any decision, but just ensuring that the certain criteria for meeting a valid claim are met, and it, and it will escalate it up to a certain process, and then whether or not the case gets referred off to a, a mediator, or Colin can come in here to talk about you know, the, the, the details, say, on some of the insurance cases of, um, a, of an algorithm-based settlement, if, if indeed it, it, if it's a straightforward sort of monetary claim that doesn't require a third-party intervention, then there will be various algorithms which can be determined according to set criteria. Uh, Colin, I don't know if you want to add, add a little bit more to that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there, this is a perfect example of a system that, that uh, not a very good online dispute resolution system. I mean, I'll tell you, I, I consult with lots and lots of organizations that essentially create an online complaint form. And they, if a consumer has an issue, they, go, they say, go fill out the complaint form. And then you fill out the complaint form, and then you hit submit, and then who knows what happens. It goes into somebody's queue. Maybe they look at it, maybe they don't. You don't have any visibility into what's going on. And then you get some output out of the back end that says, sorry, you know, you're not going to get reimbursed for your claim. I mean, that's, that is a terrible redress process. I think the airlines need to do a lot of work. Um, you know, we're currently working with a very, very large organization in the UK. Uh, and they very much have this orientation, a complaint orientation. And the thing about complaints is I can complain about anything. I can complain it's too hot. I can complain my shoes are too tight. I can complain, you know, that doesn't imply that we need to go through a resolutions process. And I think what we need to do is think creatively about how the work we do in the dispute resolution field can be brought to these types of conversations. Now, from an algorithmic perspective, um, it sounds like the issue that you were reporting was a double charge. And you should be able to go to a page, an easily discoverable page on that airline's website and say, okay, I have a problem. What kind of problem do you have? Well, my problem is I was double charged. And they should be able to automatically look into their payments database and see that you paid twice for the same thing. And that program, right at that instant, should say to you, you're right, you were double charged. We're sorry, we just credited you back one of your payments. It doesn't require the services of a mediator. It doesn't require a long, drawn-out negotiation. It doesn't require two weeks of you checking back in to see have they made a decision. It should happen immediately. And that's what I mean about algorithmic resolutions. There are cases that do require the services of human neutrals. And hopefully by using technology to do this triage, we can provide quick resolutions to cases where it's obvious that that quick resolution is merited. And, and eBay does that. eBay looks at cases and says, you know what? We're just going to pay you out for this. We're sorry you had this inconvenience. But there are also cases that require a more in-depth conversation. And the technology can help us do that filtering to make sure that we apply the human resources to the cases that most require them. Thanks, Colin. Any other comments from the panel? OK, question, yes, at the back. Uh, Stephen Bate, mediator. C um, uh, Mike, could you describe a basic platform-based mediation? It's not familiar to me, and it would be very helpful to have a, a basic grasp of that. Yes, uh, certainly. I mean, a, a basic claim, for instance, uh, I, I did mention the Modria platform was working with the no-fault uh, compensation scheme in New York, and that's through the AAA. And that's a very simple um, process where the, uh, the claimant effectively will have access to a portal. They, they've had an incident which um, meets certain criteria. They will be directed towards a particular landing page where they will upload their particular data about their name, their address, when did the incident happen, any policy numbers if they're claiming under a particular policy. They'll also have the opportunity to upload any, um, any documents, any um, photographs, any data, which will go um, into um, a central sort of case management facility. And it's, it's um, you know, a series of, of different pages which will be visible to you as the person uploading that data. So it's a, um, a very sort of intuitive experience in terms of completing the screen. And that's where I think the technology has been tried to make as, as user friendly as possible. Not, you know, to some extent it may be certain fields similar to a Twitter where you've only got 120 characters to fill in a, a descriptive, um, uh, statement to support your claim, or it may be a drop-down menu meeting certain requirements of of, of a case claim. So that's that's how the a, a 
platform basis would would work in practice. And then, as as Colin was explaining, the um, technology behind that, whether it's an algorithmic based process or whether it's a triage system, what we spoke about earlier, the the technology should be able to take over that process at that point much more quickly and effectively, I think, than a lot of the, the current redress schemes. So it's trying to be, um, trying to make it intuitive and, and easy to use, but for you to fill in data against a sort of predetermined fields and criteria, which the insurers, or in this instance, the AAA will set, set those fields out. Does that? A qu question, Tim. You I'm not getting this. I, I can quite see that, that you can have a, um, the sort of uh, rather more open-ended ADR platform that Colin was talking about. I was looking at something that I understood to be a mediation process. So I can quite see you fill in all the complaint details online. I was interested in how the mediation works online. Is it by telephone? Is it by, how is the interaction between the neutral and the parties? How does that work? Tim, you want to pick that up? Perhaps I, I could add a, a, an assist by asking, giving a couple of further examples. Um, in the audience, just a couple of rows in front of you is Graham Ross, um, who, who in, invented and brought us the mediation room, uh, which has been around for quite some time. Um, and that is a, a, an online mediation system where the entire mediation uh, can be carried out on, online in an email type of, 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 of approach, uh, but very much in a secure in, environment, which, which email isn't. Um, so if, uh, that's a good example uh, of how you can mediate purely o o online uh, and very good for cross-jurisdiction. And, and Graham has a lot more detail about that uh, if you would like to know. Uh, another example I can give you um, um, is Odro. Um, which I think is one of the sponsors uh, here, which I, I've certainly, in my insurance-related work, um, uh, been investigating quite closely, uh, because a lot of insurers um, uh, are interested in mediation. A lot aren't, uh, but, but those that are, uh, are also interested in how they can use mediation in lower-value cases. And proportionality is not just a word in the CPR for us lawyers. So insurers are, uh, are very keen on it for commercial reasons. Um, and what Odro, um, uh, as and when um, it, it is fully launched, will offer um, is a video type mediation, a Skype uh, type uh, mediation, but in a secure environment. And the idea there that you will have the mediator in, in one city, uh, maybe the claimant and his lawyer in another, um, a, perhaps a defense lawyer and a claims exec executive, um, also in different places, but all, 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 all them on screen. Um, and that is very close to being, being developed. Um, uh, now, th th that's in development, but I'm, I'm conscious that Graham's scheme has been in existence for um, a, a number of years, and there are others. Uh, my name is Andrew Garvin, and I'd like to raise a couple of points out of the ADR directive and uh, ODR regulation, uh, primarily from uh, uh, Pablo Cortes's um, presentation. Um, the first is in relation to the obligation of ADR providers to provide a resolution free or at minimal cost. Now, uh, there's nothing in the directive which explains how this is going to be paid. Um, it would seem that this effectively means that those that are established uh, through chambers of commerce, through various other existing funded organizations, uh, will have an advantage over the private sector, which effectively will be discriminated against. Um, so I'd welcome any comments from the, the panel on that. Um, the second is in relation to rejection uh, of complaints, um, of disputes as to whether it is vexatious or frivolous. And I was discussing in the um, uh, coffee break the possibility of artificial intelligence deciding what was vexatious or, frivol or frivolous. Um, the problem there is that what is, seems to be vexatious and frivolous may be actually more difficult to resolve in a way because very often it hides another dispute which has not been properly stated. It's a misstated case. Um, and then the uh, third point I wanted to raise uh, in relation to the ODR uh, is one of information as to how, um, how it is proposed to charge the user, uh, whether the mediator organization or uh, the lay user, uh, for the services that are developed through the ODR platform. I haven't understood how that works. 
Okay, thank you. Pablo, you want to pick that up? Um, no, those are very, very valid points, and frankly, I don't have a, a clear answer to that. Uh, all I can say is that the directive, uh, as you all know, these are is an European um, a legal framework which only set a, like a minimum criteria, which will be later developed uh, or implemented or transposed into national legislation. Um, this is currently conducting a consultation, is exploring these issues, and they will be developed, and hopefully some of these issues will be addressed to some extent in maybe in a, in a regulation in this country. <clears throat> Regarding the unfair advantage towards um, public entities, well, yes, if there is financial funding, um, it, there may be to some degree. Um, it, the, I think increasingly the UK, in particular in this country, uh, there is an expectation that the sector uh, will, uh, will pay the costs of resolving disputes. I don't know, if I was referring to FOSS earlier. The financial sector is paying um, uh, an annual fee to participate in two falls, and they have a, the legal obligation to do so, and as well as a case fee uh, after the third case. Um, it, it is true that they, that, you know, they may, may put public entities into an advantageous position, but I think the government is quickly withdrawing money to support these schemes, and they are hoping that will be you know, self-funded. Uh, the residual ombudsman scheme that will be set up, it will be financed by the UK government during the first year only. So I think we're moving into the direction of expecting, you know, uh, private providers to, 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 to uh, enter into the market um, and, I, uh, and, you know, to compete with public ones. Um, you know, time will tell, uh, you know, what measures the UK government will take or in other countries will take in order to, to facilitate a level playing field. Um, regarding the other comments um, uh, in relation to what is a vexatious or frivolous complaint, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Um, again, uh, I think that the ADR entities will have some discretion to make these assessments. They might set a minimum, uh, you know, a minimum value of complaints, which you know it might be developed or specified in the in, in the regulation that implements the directive. It could say, you know, complaints under 50 pounds will not be or will not necessarily need to be addressed by an ADR entity. Um, again, uh, and, and 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 the last, um, but again, you know, this. This will depend on, on each ADR entity, and I suppose it will be also the competent authorities that monitor the compliance with the, with the directive and the implementing regulation that, that ADR entities are not refusing uh, you know, meritorious or apparently meritorious claims. Um, and I think uh, the, the last comment, um, it, it was regarding um, the issue of um, was it? Costs. Yeah, uh, yes, thanks. Um, the, if you are using the European online dispute resolution platform, it will be free of cost. But this platform would only be available to deal with domestic or cross border disputes if you are a certified ADR entity. So basically, if you're a ADR provider company, it could be you know, the, the CR, it could be CEDAR, it could be Ombudsman Services. If they have achieved or you know, have obtained this accreditation or this certification from the public, um, a, from the, from the public co competent authority. Uh, otherwise, you know, they could hire the services of private providers like, you know, like Modria, they, they do tailor-made um, platforms for, for, for ADR providers. Um, I don't want to extend too much because I know there are more people who... Well, okay. Um, could, could I just add just, a, a few yeah. words? I mean, I think um, one of the points which I, I mentioned earlier is that at the ODR 2014 conference in San Francisco in, at the end of July, this particular point was, was discussed, um, uh, not in the context of European uh, legislation, but there were a number of um, uh, e-commerce organizations which uh, spoke very positively about ODR, and their 
primary driver for doing so was really brand and reputation protection. They wanted to be the place where consumers would come to them to transact on their website. They really, and they invested money to resolve any client disputes or any customer disputes because they felt that, that having a happy customer and a happy trading environment was of greater value, commercial or corporate value to them. And I think it's a, it's a real, it's a cultural change. I mean, I think your question is quite is quite right, but it's in in some respects it's it's almost starting off at the negative. You know, how is this going to be funded? Who's going to pay for it? Whereas I think it, it's going to require um, businesses and organisations to say, you know, this is the modern world. This is a competitive trading environment. This e-commerce area. If we want to make customers come to us on a cross-border or a national basis, we've got to invest in it. So uh, I think the verdict is still out, but the experience um, from, from the US was, was very telling that organizations and eBay, Colin mentioned $150 million just on sort of seller protection schemes, it was just one example, but there are numerous others. But it um, comes back to trying to build uh, consumer confidence and brand and reputation protection. Thanks. Yeah, if you don't mind, Alan, I'd like to yeah, jump, jump in, in on this too. Um, you know, uh, this I think this whole experience with the European regulation has illustrated a different approach that the, the EU is taking than, um, I would say, the U.S. market. You know, what's happening in the United States is very private in its orientation. So each company is making the decision they want to invest in this and that this is in their, their self-interest to implement these systems. Uh, we had the Managing Director of Consumers International at the conference that Mike um, mentioned, and she said, look, the, the future of consumer protection is not you know, buyers versus sellers. It's, it's collaborative. It's understanding that we need to have trust in these marketplaces, and we need to build these redress processes so as to increase confidence in online transactions. And there is a huge acknowledgment in the United States in the private sector that this is worthy of investment of tens of millions of dollars. Now, I think the question of how we're going to fund it is an interesting one. And I think uh, insurance models are the way to go. If you collect a penny a case and only 1% of those transactions generate a dispute, we're going to see a massive increase in the number of disputes that need to be resolved by mediators. But, um, but I think it's going to happen through these transparent, um, very easily accessed online resolution processes as opposed to getting filtered into face-to-face -face consumer schemes or going into the courts. You know, I think the European regulation is good because it, it raises the awareness of ODR, it's forcing the issue, but I've talked to the people in Brussels that put this thing together and they don't really know how it's going to work. You know, they're really leaving it to us to figure out how, to, how we're going to do it. And I think the same is true with uh, the UNCITRAL Online Dispute Resolution Working Group. You know, the last point that you raise, which I hear from a lot of mediators, is this fear that somehow these artificial intelligence is going to step in and technology is just going to start resolving all these cases. And I must say, in, in pretty much all of the ODR work that I've seen, there is no you know, AI algorithm that's going to come in and do the types of things that human mediators and arbitrators do. I think, uh, in fact, uh, this, the increase in volume of cases that are going to require human support is going to be overwhelming to us in the field. And I think we need to be very creative about how we rethink the services that we provide so that we can handle this you know, at eBay, we talked about drinking from the fire hose. I think that that's what we're about to have happen in the ADR field. We're going to start drinking from the fire hose. And that's why we need to get smart about these tools and techniques so that we can manage that volume in an effective way so that any dispute that comes in the process doesn't feel like they're getting the runaround. They have a very responsive, flexible process that they feel in control of. It's not an algorithm that's just, you know, spitting out a decision. Instead, it's tools that ADR providers and parties can use to dynamically build appropriate resolution flows that make them feel like they got timely and effective resolutions. Thanks, Colin. Final point from Tim? Uh, a very quick point at the, the risk of being a little flippant. Uh, recognizing a frivolous and vexatious complaint. And maybe algorithms do have something to offer, but as a former uh, litigation solicitor, having dealt with litigants in, in person, uh, I can tell you if, if the first letter comes in in spidery handwriting in green ink, um, or, or, or if the potential defendants include the Queen and the Prime Minister, um, they're, they're telltales. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Okay, I've, I've got a uh, question from Bill, and after that, I want to move the discussion across over to small claims mediation, uh, and also using online mediation for family disputes as well. So, Bill. 
Hi, uh, Bill Schooler. Uh, we built the Audro platform, and thank you. Uh, delighted that Tim mentioned it. Um, but I tend to agree with Bill that when we think of ODR, and we're certainly here today about ODR to think about the future and to think about innovation and disruptive technology. So I would suggest that it's, it's more helpful, as Bill was suggesting, to think of ODR not as telephone or not as which was disruptive 100 years ago. Uh, or email, which was disruptive maybe 20 years ago. But do you think of the technology, the disruptive technologies that are available now, some of which only became available 12 months ago, and to look at how can we use those to assist the mediation or the, the dispute resolution uh, industry. And I think where it would be really helpful is for technology companies like ourselves to work closely with the dispute resolution specialists and the professionals, people that are here today, and to look at how we can bring this technology in a way that's going to help the different situations. And whilst I'm not a mediator, I've trained as a mediator, I recognise that there's all different situations of conflict and they all need different ways of resolution. And technology can do that in different ways. Mm. But supporting the specialists that, that have been trained and spent so many years and have got the expertise in how best to deal and how best to resolve conflicts. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Bill. So, Joe, you were doing about 100 mediations a month, is that right? Thank you. Hello? Okay. Um, I think you've just always got to be mindful of the individuals. And when you were talking about, am I going to get to speak to a human being? Actually, what we've discovered with small claims is that you one size just cannot fit all. You know, I... I have dabbled in looking at Modria, I've looked at Odro. I've still got people that just want to speak to somebody on the telephone. So how do I get around that? How do I meet both parties' needs? Um, and so what we've done is we've kind of taken all of the elements, but we've asked the parties what, what they're comfortable with. And if you suddenly switch to only a platform there will be particularly and I can only speak on small claims so I apologize but there will be people that you know even just emailing is is a challenge for them and so there are it's all about for me it's about access to justice and access to dispute resolution and that's why the service that we provide has to make sure that it covers that also um, and so I think that we are being innovative, and I think it's it's kind of foolish to think that this isn't coming because it is and it's here, but I don't necessarily think it fits absolutely everything, but I think you can take little elements from different places to give a, I suppose, like a, a bespoke way of resolving that individuals. So I'm probably a bit unpopular, really, um, but that, that's just the approach that we take, and it's working. It's really working because, you know, they're our customers. They're, we are the consumers, aren't we? And I figure that I would want to know that a service like mine exists. If I have a broken fridge and I'm getting nowhere with you-know-who, I would want to know that there is a cost-effective, quick way of doing it, that I don't have to leave my business or get my kids to be looked after or whatever. I can sit at home. I can have my appointment with a skilled mediator because I'm getting on my soapbox now. Well, Joe, t <laughs> tell us, uh, what, what sort of value claims are you mediating? Well, they can be anything from £50 up to £50,000. And that's interesting because we're small claims mediation. But we still get people coming to us because of the style of the method that we offer. Solicitors will come to us and say, we've got a hearing in a week. We've been told we really have got to crack on in and get, can you do this? And we do. We do it in a couple of days. And nobody has to leave anywhere. And so it may not be specifically ODR, but I think it's just imaginative and just meeting the needs of regular people. Okay. And Stephen, you're using um, online mediation for family disputes, matrimonial disputes. Could you say a little bit more about how you, uh, how you do that? Yeah, and just to say that I came to it much in the way that you mentioned at the beginning, Alec, which was I, I saw that there are millions of members of the public who are disenfranchised by the current 
um, dispute resolution services offered by solicitors and mediators. For example, um, there are five million people suffering from anxiety at any time or have been diagnosed with anxiety uh, in this country. Now, one of the symptoms of anxiety is agoraphobia and many people going through a divorce, which is the work I do, uh, will be suffering from anxiety and won't be able to leave their home. And you just think, well, if you can't leave your home, how are you going to go and see a solicitor or a mediator to help you resolve your problem? So we're not actually reaching out to these people. Um, and that's what motivated me to become involved in uh, working online. I mean, I, the way I work is, is via Skype or via, by Zoom. Um, it is slightly different. My sessions will be an hour max. I'm usually dealing with parenting problems or financial problems resulting from a, a relationship breakdown. They're quite emotionally intensive. And an hour at staring at the screen for anyone is certainly enough. And it's certainly enough for me. I don't know about the clients, but I limit it to an hour. I change my mediation agreement. Really important this, if you're doing online, you need to change your mediation agreement so that it uh, the participants are signing up to not recording the session because it's quite easy to record if you're using um, some of the ones that I'm using, Zoom and Skype, and also not to have anyone hidden in the room behind the, the laptop. So those are things that I, I, I will incorporate in my agreement to media. And you have, to change your, you have to change your style to a certain extent. I mean, you're looking at two people on a screen often, and they both think you're looking at them. So you can't just say, so what do you think about that? What, what, you, know, you have to say, so John, what do you think about that? So there's a bit of, um, you, know, you have to use their names regularly. So there's some coaching before they start working online. And really important, because I, we've mentioned it all the way through today, there's, there's a lot of testing. I have a test call. Uh, I work for myself. I don't have anyone else working for me, so I don't have someone to do a test call with me. But I, I schedule a test call um, to make sure that whoever it is I'm going to be working with actually knows how to use the, the technology and uh, that the technology works. And oft, often it doesn't, and you've got to have your contingencies so that when the, the video fails, you've got their phone numbers, etc. cetera. So um, it, it, is, it, is, it is incredibly difficult. It is far more difficult than working, uh, in some cases, um, with people in the room. But on the other hand, it's giving access to a lot of people, the Y2 generation, who frankly just want to um, do it online because they don't want to, you know, don't want to come to our offices. And what's wrong with that? Good. Thank you, Stephen. We've got a, uh, time for a few more questions. Henry at the back. Hi, Henry Minto, Civil and Commercial Media. Sorry. Uh, I've just got a statistical question. Of the 60 million eBay um, disputes, how many actually go to a third-party mediator? Sure. Uh, well, of the 60 million right now at eBay, not many go to third-party mediation. As I mentioned, Square Trade did a couple million uh, feedback mediations uh, at, in the 2000 to 2004 time frame. Now the process at eBay is much more facilitated negotiation, technology facilitated negotiation. And if the parties can't work it out through direct communication, then it goes to an evaluative process where a customer service rep or an outside evaluator renders a decision. But um, eBay's not really leveraging mediation. We found it was not that, not that effective in, uh, in a lot of these low dollar value, high volume commercial transactions. People, people didn't have a lot of patience for it. We found actually at eBay, the, the ideal time to resolve a dispute was somewhere between seven and 11 days. And if, if the dispute took more than 11 days to resolve, the parties were, frust were more frustrated than if they just lost up front. So the time expectations are very aggressive on eBay. People want quick, quick resolutions. And mediation turned out to be not a very good fit with that. OK, any other questions? All right, any closing remarks from the panel? Tim. Um, I, I'd just like to pay tribute to, to what Joe has, has said and the work of the small claims mediators up and down uh, the, the country. Um, as a member of the Civil Justice Council, I saw the start of that scheme, I saw the reports, um, and I saw that they weren't getting qualified people as mediators. 
And I thought, that's not right. And I thought, this is never going, this is never going to work. Uh, 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 and talk about each of your words. I was absolutely astounded um, by the success of the Small Claims Mediation Service. And as I saw the reports come in, um, the, the volumes, the thousands of complaints that were, were dealt with, uh, and the way that the, 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 the telephone mediation system just took off, um, I, I think is absolutely incredible. Um, I, I, and I really empathise with what Joe said about listening to what people want, rather than saying, I'm a mediator, this is what I've got to give, uh, to listen to what they want and, and how they want it. Um, the uh, uh, colleagues are talking about, uh, uh, and you were referring to the, the, the new generation who will want to do it on their iPads and they want to do it now. That's, that's the world we, we live in. And in my context, what that means is listening to insurers uh, uh, and the fact that even with six-figure sums, they don't want to travel um, uh, and be in another city to deal with something for half a day. Um, they want to be at their desk, they want to plug in and go online, and if they can deal with a six-figure dispute, which is routine to them and to me uh, as a mediator and, uh, and litigator, and routine to, to the, um, the, the claimant lawyer, why not deal with it um, on, on the screen, on, on the email, but bringing what we have to offer in, in a different way? So I think that's what I've learned from the small claims mediation system and just how fantastic um, a success it has been. And, and I still, uh, it's still, I think, unrecognised um, as the huge success that it is. So that's a great learning point for me um, in looking at how we use technology. And, Alad, you asked me something about the barriers mm. uh, in, in the way, uh, and the barriers are people. It's, it's what's in between our ears. Um, that's, that's the barriers to using technology um, uh, for, for, for progressing me mediation. And we've all got a part to play in that. So that's my finish, if that's OK. OK, thank you, Tim. And um, Colin, final word from you before you go back to bed. Yeah, you know, I, I actually want to echo what Tim said. Um, uh, and uh, I think I couldn't agree more with what Joe said. You know, uh, this is not about rah, rah, ODR is great, we should use ODR for everything. That's not the way to think about this. Uh, what online dispute resolution offers is more tools for the dispute resolver's toolbox. And there are many cases that need and should be resolved offline. But I think I go back to a point that I, I made in connection with what Mike said at the beginning. The line between online dispute resolution and face-to-face uh, -face dispute resolution is blurring all the time. And it's a false dichotomy to say, should we use technology for this or should we not use technology for this? All of our lives are digitizing, especially with the younger generation. We spend an, an inordinate amount of time texting our friends, emailing our friends, doing video conferencing, and it's seamless the way it's integrated into our lives. We don't have to decide, do we want to live a face-to-face -face life or an online life? Our society is digitizing, expectations are changing. We in the dispute resolution field need to adjust to the needs of our parties. And that means we need to understand online options and have them available if we feel that that's the best thing that's gonna help our parties reach agreement. But if we don't think technology is the right choice, absolutely, we should convene face-to-face -face meetings and we should use technology in a hybrid fashion with face-to-face -face and telephone interaction. So um, that's my perspective. Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much for uh, dialing in from Cincinnati. Good luck with the conference. And, thank uh, you. We'll, I'm sure we'll speak soon. Um, a big thank you. Joe? Can I just, just go for it? Oh, yes. Go for it. 60 seconds, 140 characters. Okay, I'll be really quick. Um, <laughs> I really love the, the Modria platform. I love Odro. One of the biggest challenges in small claims is small claims equals small fees. And you've got to still pay a mediator and you don't want to pass the cost on of whatever technology that you're using. So at the moment, we are just using what is available to us that is free. I would love to be able to speak to somebody that could perhaps work with us so that we can come up with a more cost-effective way using the, the bells and whistles technology that we don't have to pass on the Good. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Stephen. And again, thanks, Colin. And um, a round of applause, everyone. <laughs>